The war in Portugal continued along its long before set turmoil path. Where the Entente had fought back the Syndicalists up until the border with France, now they were being pushed back almost into the sea. Only a bunch of small areas were left, scattered and scarred, held by men who grew more desperate by the hour. An evacuation had been set in motion by multiple Entente countries. Canada managed to successfully evacuate 40,000 men, while others were chosen to stay behind to cover the evacuees. Many of them paid with their lives. Though it had been predicted for weeks, a devastating blow was dealt to the Entente on October 23rd when news went out that Lisbon had fallen to the Syndicalists. With the help of Italy, the Union of Britain and the Commune of France, Spain had been reinstated into their ranks with extra landmass stolen from Portugal. Five days after the fall of Lisbon, word got out that Portugal had capitulated. Though many thought that the fighting in this area was done with, the truth of the matter was that the battle for Portugal was far from over as France was about to make a critical mistake. In a similar sense as before, France pulled back most of its troops out of Portugal to aid in the battle against Austria and Russia to the east. They left it to countries like Italy to deal with the leftovers of the Entente. But the Italians were not as well trained and those fighting on the Entente side were able to hold out long enough for reinforcements to arrive. Canada also sent fresh troops towards Europe once more, but this time it was not Portugal they were being sent to. Both Finland and Russia were unable to get a firm grip on the pacing for the war to the east. Many would have thought Russia to perform better, but it turned into a true slugfest. The nation that surprised everyone was Austria, standing robust like an unbreakable wall. It was true that the Syndicalists were making progress on invading the country little by little, but their morale had been shaken at the resilience of the Austrian soldier. As 1942 rolled by, new innovations regarding weapons technology were also implemented and Canada was one of the first countries to do so. At the beginning of the second week of that year, the Americans launched another assault in Portugal to take the land back once more. They requested other countries to join as well, but Canada had different plans. A similar battle tactic in Portugal would surely once again end in failure once France resets their forces on the border. Especially with France actually making progress against the Russians. Italy, that still held, but was faltering at several sides with Austria and Romania dealing blows left and right, was seen by King Edward as the next target that could actually be destroyed. As the first month of 1942 came to a close, it was revealed publicly that the Feng Chan government in Asia had fallen. Battle for dominance continued on this side as well, though it was not the focus of the Entente forces for the moment. Nations like the Dominion of India and the West Indies had joined the second assault in Portugal and slowly they were fighting their way up north again. But Canada was about to send 20,000 troops towards Sicily to aid Romania and Austria in the fight against Mussolini's forces. The island of Sicily itself had been secured and was now held by a combination of Austrian, Romanian, Greek and Russian units. In a month time, the second offensive had gained a lot of momentum and territory back. The Syndicalist troops in Portugal had mostly been less experienced units and were easily overwhelmed. In the second half of March, the Canadian troops were about to arrive in Sicily. An offensive spanning the main Italian land had already been underway to attack it from both the north and the south. The Canadians were received as brothers by the other nations and many shared stories, delicacies from their home country and smokes as they made their way to the east. And then once more news arrived from Asia as the Mongolians had fallen as well. An ending that was set in motion from the moment that their greedy Khan came into power. By the first week of April the Entente had almost taken back the entirety of Portugal once more, but news arrived that the Commune of France was indeed marching troops towards their border area as well. The 20,000 Canadians had finally joined the Austrians and Romanians and together would spill blood on Italian soil. 
Though most of the opposition consisted of Italian troops, some of them were aided by British syndicalist forces. By now America had reached the French border in the exact location where they previously were being pushed back. Though French reinforcements were on their way, they were still on the move, giving the soldiers of the Entente hope to at least head deeper into France than previously. The assaults in Italy also went swell for the Entente, mainly due to the front line being narrow and the opposition being inexperienced. Most of the Italians' best troops had perished during the battles in Sicily over the past months. They had suffered more than half a million casualties during this war. By May the 7th, what was predicted by King Edward seemingly became true. The second offensive in Portugal by the Americans was halted as the French had arrived and once again pushed the invader back south. As the Canadians were stormwalling over the Italian landmass, they left pockets of resistance here and there. Friendly nations like the Russians said that they would take care of it as most of the soldiers either capitulated or were driven into the sea as they did their brave last stand. By June the 2nd, it became clear how much of a similar display in Portugal was about to happen with so much territory lost to the syndicalists once more. It was a stunning display. Where the syndicalists were gaining so much ground to the west, they were losing it to the east. The real question was though, if the destruction of Italy and a possible third offensive in Portugal could be enough to tip the scale. By the first week of July, the Kingdom of France had successfully pulled off a naval invasion on the French homeland. This took a new turn, as they now were in control behind enemy lines. Though the Canadian troops had made great progress over the last weeks, their pace was being forced slower and slower due to increased enemy resistance the closer they got to Rome. At the end of July, the Americans and other Entente members had once again fully been pushed to the shore. It was uncertain if another offensive would indeed be greenlit by their generals. Austrian soldiers were involved in heavy fighting along the Italian coast to secure the northern part of the country as most of the south had already been dealt with. Instead of launching a new offensive in Portugal, America took the opportunity of the naval invasion done by the Kingdom of France to send more troops directly into the heart of the syndicalist nation. But they met heavy enemy resistance from every angle. By now, the syndicalists had put a dent in the Austrian front line, but the overall defensive line was still so wide that not much progress could be done. The amount of reinforcements currently situated in Portugal was worrying. Though the Kingdom of France was making headway up north, it was questionable what the outcome would be were these units to reinforce at their front. Then on the 30th of August 1942, news arrived that Italy had capitulated. For the moment, control was reinstated with Romania as the Italian government went into exile. This was another great victory for the Entente, but it was now a question if they could hold the taken land unlike Portugal. The Canadian troops near Rome were immediately sent north towards the border with France and secure it. From here on out, an establishment with the Kingdom of France needed to be made to strengthen the front taken with the naval invasion. A new offensive plan was made as the Canadians would push with their tanks and infantry up north to secure a bigger landmass as the Kingdom of France would move east towards the newly established Romanian border and secure any harbors to the south. With France being forced to send even more reinforcements from the eastern front to deal with both the attacks around Portugal and now also with the Kingdom's naval invasion, it gave Russia the long sought opportunity to finally move west. The syndicalist French were bleeding. Everyone punished them from all sides, and by now, the war had cost them almost two and a half million men in total. A third offensive in Portugal seemed unlikely by now. Even if the French reinforcing units were to leave, they would meet resistance where the exiled French had planned their naval invasion, thus putting them in hand's reach to counter another resurgence. But then, right as things started to look up, the Kingdom of France got word that turmoil was brewing from within as multiple uprisings occurred in their held territory in Africa. They would now be forced to divide their strength overseas 
and domestically. 